Hello and welcome to Feral Thinker's podcast on streaming television with the cord cut. This podcast is for the 16th of July, 2016. Today I have things to tell you about Amazon Prime, YouTube's free association, and Asian cinema. Amazon Prime. Amazon Prime has recently added Star Trek, the motion picture, This is the first one that starred Shatner and Nimoy in the theaters. The Shining, the great Stanley Kubrick's wonderful masterpiece from Stephen King's novel. And Terminator Genesis, and also Hotel Rwanda. For our television, they've just added season five of Suits, Gordimer Gibbon's Life on Normal Street, Season 2, Part 2. I assume if you're into that, you'll know what that means. Hannibal, Season 3, and All or Nothing, a season with the Arizona Cardinals. YouTube's free association. YouTube lets me use my phone as a YouTube remote control that works through my Roku so I can watch the videos on my big screen and with my sound system purring. This provides a theatrical experience and it's handy because, for example, I can queue up a bunch of the videos for which YouTube has sent notifications and watch them one after the other first thing in the morning while my brain is ready for nothing but coffee. When I run out of videos in the queue, YouTube starts free associating. Yes, of course there's a switch in the settings to turn this off, but I have a lot of fun of with seeing where it goes. The associations are based on two things. Who made the video and what the tags associated with the video are. So, for example, if the last thing in my queue is a Casey Neistat video, then the YouTube app on my phone and the Roku box are going to sit there and play Casey Neistat videos all day long. The man has a lot of material out there. But if the last thing in the queue was by a YouTuber not quite as prolific as Casey, the association might form on the basis of the topical tags attached to the video. If the last video was about how to cook Taiwanese chicken, then YouTube might go on with other Asian cooking videos for a while. But depending upon how the tags go, you could wind up looking at apartments and houses in Tokyo or chicken in Texas. In fact, It's fun to leave it to its own devices and see just where it will go. Asian Cinema. I usually start my day with catching up with the YouTubers that I follow, but this morning I got distracted and landed in front of my desktop computer. YouTube started free associating and somehow went from some YouTubers in Asia to Cradle to the Grave movie, 2003, with Jet Li... DMX and Anthony Anderson. The quality of the recording of the film was a bit dodgy though, so I used Roku search and found that the movie was available on Netflix, so I put it on there as a kind of background noise while I worked. What really caught my interest at the beginning of the movie was Jet Li's descending the outside of a high-rise apartment building by catching with his hands the ledge of each balcony as he passed it. So he never fell more than one floor at a time and never fell that fast. Of course, I realized that this was really all an illusion of a cinema, but I love suspending disbelief for people who appear to be suspended 20 stories up with nothing but the strength of their hands to keep them safe. There's another movie, Lost in Hong Kong, for which I saw a preview some months ago, and I had it on my Roku alert list. In that movie, two guys on a pedestrian bridge or over a street with heavy traffic are fighting over a camera because of some incriminating pictures in that camera's memory, and the guy who owns the camera treasures it like a mother treasures a baby. He's only an aspiring YouTuber, but he treasures filmmaking with his life. In the course of the fight, the camera goes over the rail, and the owner of the camera jumps over the rail without hesitation. At the last possible millisecond, 
he grabs the camera's lanyard with, with one hand and he grabs a strut of the bridge with the other. Yet his opponent in the fray wants the incriminating pictures badly so the fight somehow continues. This all happens in roughly 30 seconds. But it was cause for me to seek this movie out. And lo and behold, one day a miracle occurred and it showed up on my Roku watch list. Overall, Lost in Hong Kong was an okay, formulaic, often predictable action comedy romance in which the hero of the movie, not the cameraman, but his brother-in-law, makes up with his wife as they are caught suspended on a thick pane of glass 30 stories in the air alongside a building under construction. To further complicate the thrills, the glass is slippery and prone to tilt if its occupants are careful to balance their weight across the surface of the glass. So all at once they are negotiating both the rules of a marriage and the laws of physics and during the course of the scene they are joined by a third and then a fourth person one of whom has a gun. So yeah the the script overall was tolerable but the high altitude scenes were spectacular. You should recognize this as Hong Kong cinema as opposed to mainland Chinese cinema. Even after directors like John Woo immigrated from Hong Kong and came to the United States, the former British colony has remained a center for gritty cop shows, chase scenes, and action movies, some of which contain as much depth as they do action. There's good writing and good cinema happening there, and pitifully little of it is making it beyond those shores to the U.S. For instance, Port of Call, a 2015 film edited and directed by Philip Young at the 35th Hong Kong Film Awards. The, the movie won Best Screenplay, Best Actor and Actress, Best Supporting Actor and Actress, and Best Cinematography. The film is based on a real murder case where a dismembered corpse of a murdered 16-year-old prostitute girl was found in Hong Kong in 2008. From the snippets that I saw, the film looks excellent, but as far as I can see, there has been no distribution in the U.S. except for a showing at the 13th New York Asian Film Festival, where it won the Star Asia Award for actor Aaron Kwok. Port of Call is only one example. There are reels and reels of Asian films that deserve to be seen here in the U.S. The technology is readily available to make this film sharing cheap and profitable to anyone involved. And cranking out a few subtitles isn't a massive undertaking. Meanwhile, American television and movies enjoy global distribution. When I was in Korea, the multiplexes would mostly have new American releases. At the same time, the Americans got them. And just a couple of Korean films. Korean cinema isn't the behemoth that American cinema is, so one or two releases, one or two Korean releases was probably about right. But I would like to be able to see them and Hong Kong film and Beijing film and other Asian films in American multiplexes as well. And if you can't put the Asian films in American multiplexes, the least you could do is make it available for streaming. That's a much simpler operation than arranging distribution of a film across all of the American multiplexes. I've been into Asian cinema since one weekend many years ago. I attended at the University of Texas a conference of Chinese culture and a participant, I wish I remember her name, presented a wonderful comparison between mainland and Hong Kong cinema. And I believe this was before the British handed Hong Kong over to the Chinese. That, that talk created a spark that has stayed with me ever since, and on the rare occasion that I find Asian cinema, I watch it. Before that, I was a fan of Akira Kurosawa, but I was ignorant of the Chinese action for a long while. On-demand streaming has helped tremendously with accessibility, but there's a long way to go. Even after I became interested in Chinese film generally, I still wasn't into the martial arts films. I wasn't a fan of the Kung Fu television show either. It was probably Quentin Tarantino who got me interested in the fight films, and since then I've learned that not every fight film is made equal. To like these, I had to watch the good ones, 
and among them the Ip Man films are some of the best. Eventually, the traditions of this style of cinema, even the stranger talents like great leaps that amount to levitation, become acceptable and enjoyable. The combat scenes are like great ballets produced once and only once for the filming of that movie. It's a new language of film for the uninitiated, but once you get into it, it's a lot of fun. And that brings me full circle back to Cradle to the Grave movie. For one thing, I thought the number two alluded to a one, that this was a sequel, but IMDb doesn't seem to turn anything up, so I'm thinking that two is just a a cheesy way to save yourself from writing T.O., a preposition. Who knows? Although it features some Asians doing the moves, it is not an Asian fight film per se, and the fight scenes suffer because Jet Li does not find a worthy opponent in this movie. Movies like Cradle to the Grave have their time and place. It would make a great movie at the drive-in, if we still had drive-ins. It would go well as a pizza and beer movie, but keep in mind that it is not an Asian martial arts film, and You shouldn't judge the genre by that. I think I watched it just for those high-altitude, floor-by-floor drops. And by the way, of the thing of all the Asian parts, like Scarlett Johansson playing in uh, the Ghost in the Machine movie, why in the world did they get David Carradine to play in Kung Fu? I suspect that the dearth of Asian actors in American-made films is probably closely connected to the dearth of Asian-made films in American theaters and even on American streaming television. So come on, people. It's a big world out there, and I would like to see a little more of it than what's coming out of Southern California. That's it for today's podcast. Thanks so much for listening. You can follow this program through my blog at dmasonwest.com or you can follow along through any of my social network presences which are listed at feralthinker.com. This podcast is published daily with a release at 4 p.m. Central U.S. time or 2100 hours Greenwich Mean Time. Thanks 